Well, thank you, um, <clears throat> April, for the invite. Appreciate uh, uh, being back at this uh, audience and venue um, in real life, of course. So let's see if I know how to work this. Uh, it's the same one. So while the topic is uh, hedge fund in a box, just to give you a little background, I mean, uh, most, most of you, well, maybe not in this audience, but um, most people in finance know me um, as, as a stat arb guy, so I've been running money for almost 25 years in different capacities, mutual funds, hedge funds, uh, mostly market neutral equities, stat arb, things like that. Um, what I'm talking about today is how to automate uh, um, hedge funds in particular, this one prototype that I've got, and in general, the platform I'm going to introduce, I'll give you a little background. Basically, this framework, once you have the framework, it allows you to kind of automate uh, essentially any, uh, you know, uh, uh, linear view on equities uh, for buy side purposes. So you could run a mutual fund or 130-30 or a hedge fund or whatever you please on it, right? But you can also turn it into um, a fully systematic version of of uh, sell side equity research because basically what this allows us to do is we, we, we can create sort of, you know, the same kind of uh, equity research that any sell side bank might create on a single stock because we're already covering all of those stocks and then those same rankings, the same alphas just go into sort of the buy side application of turning it into a hedge fund or a mutual fund or whatever you please. So, oh, I see, I can see the screen over here. Um, so the point is that, you know, just a little background because I think there's probably more uh, tech-oriented folks in this audience. Uh, uh, if you go back to the 60s and 70s and CAPM and the first index funds at Wells Fargo, et cetera, you know, the overall th trend for obvious reasons is that yesterday's alpha becomes today's beta and over time alpha decays. Over time things get more sort of commoditized and... Uh, systematized in what used to be the domain of the uh, Peter Lynch's of the world and, you know, and, and the stock pickers, uh, the, the masters of the universe. Over time, it's become obvious that all of that can be, you know, uh, turned into a hedge fund in a box. You don't basically need David Einhorn to have great insights because we can count all of those insights very nicely <laughs> and turn it into basically any orientation you want. And I'll show you essentially everything that most fundamental PMs do, whether it's uh, you know, deep value or growth at a reasonable price or QGARP or Valmo or Qualmo or GrowthMo or, you know, I mean, anything that, you know, fundamental PMs tend to talk about. I mean, many of them these days want to like talking about quality. It must be high quality. We're going into a recession, growth at reasonable price, right? So all of that stuff can be done once you have this framework. So here's the framework. You start with a large, which I believe is uh, the largest uh, library of such factors. We take hundreds of them, right? So we take this enormous uh, factor library in order to automate the whole sort of, you know, kind of very expansive coverage of all the um, ideas. And this is essentially the factor literature on taming the factor zoo. So the first thing is uh, this part, which is taming the factor zoo and uh, trying to make sense of uh, all these uh, anomalies that have been documented in in uh, the academic literature. So we take all of them, essentially it's Pharma, French, and steroids. You start with your style and size, the good old Pharma, French type of factors, and then you add on all the other stuff, you know, there was Carhartt and Novi Marks and, uh, you know, the Jagdish Chitman type of stuff. And there's, there's a whole ton of uh, literature on this. And so you take all of that. Um, in, in the vein of the academic literature, you want to basically uh, just track, you know, some kind of uh, market neutral spread um, meaning what, what, what are the best stocks, what are the worst stocks, and you just sort of take the equal weighted, you know, uh, differential, you compound the geometric returns of the top minus bottom. So that's the framework of what we're doing. Um, the, a, the AI stuff in here is very well hidden. It's actually all the actions going on inside the composition of these smart betas. That's where the ensemble learning takes place. So if you look at this factor library on the left-hand side of the page, you've got all the actual smart betas. The names sound very familiar, and they're perhaps deceptively familiar because you might look at it and say, well, what a big yawn, deep value, relative value, what's the big deal here? Everybody knows this stuff. And, and I will agree with you that these, these days, I mean, this stuff is fairly well known. It's very familiar. Anybody could go into Bloomberg and, you know, grab some expression of value or growth or momentum, right? It's not, it's not very uh, cutting edge anymore, I mean, at least not... Uh, relative to the late 90s when I first launched these type of funds at Merrill Lynch um, um, with uh, the former CIO of the firm. And um, look, I mean, back, back then it was very cutting edge because there were like maybe five shops doing it, AQR and us and uh, a couple others. But um, 
it, 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 it is now, what I'm now showing you is very cutting edge, it's just the names are sort of deceptive because you see the ensemble learning is happening inside this. So this is not your father's growth or value and the numbers I'm gonna show you has nothing to do with the growth or value you might see in, a, uh, in, in an ETF or a fund that you hear about in the Wall Street Journal or something, right? So these numbers will look very outlandish for good reason. So what's happening is actually we're taking the hundreds of factors, collapsing them into the 18, partitioning them into the 18 categories. These are not pure uh, factors in a mathematical orthogonalized sense. They're deliberately meant to be intuitive. They're not pure at all. There's gonna be some overlap and that's fine. We want the overlap. We just want them to represent what fundamental PMs believe is growth or value, right? But the trick is that what's happening inside them is you're trying to figure out the optimal combination of factors that you want to run over time. And, and the, the ensemble's learning on an expanding window. So we've now got 23 and a third year of history, right? So uh, I guess quarter, so 23 and a quarter years of history as of now, roughly. And so the ensemble just keeps learning and every month you re-optimize and say, what's the best combination? I run all different methodologies. You throw a random forest at it. You throw bagging and boosting and uh, maximize this and minimize that, right? So you try all these different tricks and you say, what's the best answer? Let's pick that one. That's the uh, set of uh, factor weights I'm gonna hold for next month. And that's the key insight here is that, you know, we're doing something very funky inside these uh, smart betas. Now, most of this history is monthly reval, so it's somewhat over, uh, understated, actually. Most people find this very surprising, and it is surprising because um, um, it, you will rarely see a backtest that actually looks worse than the live, right? You've probably never seen a bad backtest in your life, and I promise mine is not that bad either. Um, but the, the, the interesting thing is that our live numbers, three and a quarter years that we've been publishing them, are actually much higher than the backtest. Right, that's a bit unusual. But the main reason for that is because the 19 years of the back cast, I, I don't really want to call it a back test because we've been live as quantity for 13 years, so much of the history does correspond to um, live data we were collecting and trading in, in the fund, et cetera. The point is that um, the back cast we're showing you for the 19 years is monthly. So for higher turnover factors, it's gonna massively understate the reality, right? So if you have something like mean reversion or price momentum or, or, or more frequently um, you know, traded factors, more, more higher turnover stuff like, for instance, analyst ratings and revisions and you know, diffusion metrics on you know, how much is the analyst taking the number up or down, all those types of things, right? Those change very fast. So it makes a big difference. Um, but you know, here's the litmus test. I mean, the proof has to be in the pudding and uh, here we are. So if you look at the lighter blue bars, those numbers show what the um, ensemble is delivering versus the naive factors. So the naive factors given to us by the sort of uh, industry and academia, it's like, well, what, what do people think of as uh, uh, relative value? Well, probably price to earnings. Pretty much everybody looks at PE, fine, so we just take LT and PE. What's the notion of deep value? Well, that's pretty much the Fama French book to market, right? So it's whatever the well-known factor is. Let's take the very top one over there, leverage. So that's gonna be debt to equity, it's balance sheet leverage. Um, in each case, what we're trying to show you is that the ensemble can dramatically beat, actually there is one exception, short interest, we don't manage to beat the benchmark, interestingly, uh, but it doesn't matter because it's not a real source of alpha, it's just used for risk control. Um, the point is that in every case except for short interest, w w you'll see the blue bars are dramatically higher than the dark blue bars, right? And that's the real, that's the real thing that's going on. In, in many instances, you'll notice that the dark blue bar is actually negative. So for leverage or growth or risk, which is actually low vol, um, the, the well-documented low vol anomaly. In, in most of these cases, what's happened is that over the past 30 years of quant funds, all the two sigmas and the AQRs and the Rentex, you know, trading the stuff, it's been, it's been pretty well arbitrage. So the well-known factors are now strictly negative. That in itself is a huge revelation. The dark blue bars are telling you, don't waste your time. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to look at PE and PV and, and uh, debt to equity, feel free, but it's not going to get you anywhere fast because everybody knows that stuff. So if you look at the pooled ICs and the T stats and everything, you can convince yourself further. Um, the bottom line is once you combine them and sort of harvest the correlation benefits, you start getting something much more powerful. So even if you didn't have the greatest, you know, uh, things in sliced bread, but if you just combine 
uh, all, you know, uncorrelated sources of alpha, you might get very strong signals, and that's what we're showing you. But in this case, I'm actually arguing that we've hopefully built, I think we've built very high octane smart betas, the outsample evidence would suggest. And that's why when you do the Sharp and Certino on the combos, you get some ridiculous numbers, which are kind of hard to believe, actually. Um, I'll just skip this turnover stuff, but uh, th there is a very simple intuition to what's going on here, right? Like basically, doesn't go back. Uh, yeah, um, jumped too, back too much, okay. Uh, in, in the smart betas, remember I told you that the dailies make a difference because some of them, like your mean reversion, the reversal last one, ART analyst ratings, enhancement, these have very high turnover relative to pure fundamentals, right? So if you have something like uh, earnings, your revenue stability, whatever, those things hardly change. So that you could just even rebound once a month, a quarter, you know, in the academic papers, sometimes they do it once a year. Uh, who cares? Uh, but the point is for other things that matters a lot, the turnover is going to be much higher. So if you want to harvest those, it makes a big difference. Um, obviously, the signals that have more of those will have higher turnover. But now let's look at the outsample evidence. So as of today, uh, if I look at this as um, uh, uh, 2022, right? So daily rebalance, geometrically compounded spreads, right? You got the long side versus the short and then the spread return. So look at the daily, monthly, year to date. Well, just let's just look at that last column, year to date, uh, compounded geometric spread. As you may know, the NASDAQ selling off pretty dramatically today, yesterday, this week, as we speak, you know. Um, these spreads are actually a lot higher now. So whatever these numbers are, I can tell you that they're a lot higher as of today. Um, and, and I'll give you an example uh, because of the acceleration of the sell-off. So, I mean, just staring at this stuff, you could probably convince yourself when you see these kind of really astronomical numbers, deep value up 109%, obviously the regime has changed. Um, but it might tell you that we are in a NASDAQ-style crash. Now, nobody rings a bell at the top and tells you this is a bear market, but I'm telling you that this looks like a bear market <laughs> to me. Now, remember, the NASDAQ crash took a long time. It took, you know, it went on for years. So we're in the midst of this very slow motion process, but it's happening as we speak. And um, I mean, year to date, a lot of this stuff is up an obscene amount as well. That tells you that, you know, that trend has not changed. Um, let's take a look at, uh, so the, the last slide was year, no, life to date. So you look at the very long-term patterns, what's happening over 23 years, what's happening over the past year, uh, year to date. Okay, so here we are. Now let's look at the combos. So this is how much of that can you monetize, right? So for instance, last year, um, uh, <clears throat> Taking this, the 18 smart betas and uh, taking some various combinations like uh, our Fab 14, where you basically drop four of them and you take uh, 14 that seem uh, less correlated, et cetera. That got you a pretty nice 107% return gross, 100 by 100, right? So there's no extra leverage which a market neutral fund would use, uh, but there's also no T cost and uh, uh, fees in here. So modulo T cost, but it's a monthly rebound, so costs are basically de minimis. You're talking a few basis points. Um, the costs are not really significant. The fees would be if you, you know, wanted to put some fees in there. But then if you ran it with normal leverage, the numbers would be even more obscene. Um, so there's something interesting going on here because you, you, you see these numbers are pretty ridiculous. Uh, you, you've, you've got a huge contribution from the short side, and I'll tell you in a second why. Um, and then you've got a nice contribution from the long side. Uh, this year, now this is the longer term picture, whereas I just want to show you this year's picture before I get to the actual hedge fund in the box. Um, so this year's picture, you can see that, you know, some of these numbers are looking very interesting, like Valmo, right? So that's a simple combination of uh, value and growth momentum. Um, that's also called GARP. So the, the GARP is now, as of today, up to like 38 or 39 percent. This was from... Uh, a few days ago, and, and uh, it was showing 29%, but it's, uh, it's actually substantially higher now. So um, the short side of the uh, alpha is really kicking in because what's happening is that as the Fed, you know, you, you saw that yesterday, basically, as soon as Paul got on stage and started talking about uh, 50 beeps being on the table, um, you know, market sold off again. So. It's, it's, this is really working because the long duration stocks are selling off pretty dramatically, right? So all of the Cathy Wood arc type of complex, and actually that's what really drove the gains last year as well. So the, the model's picking up on that. I mean, basically what the ensemble is recognizing is that you had a massive bubble. You had a super bubble in all the Cathy Wood type of stuff. Now, 
you may argue, well, that's innovation. And uh, the, the point is that from a longer term valuation perspective, U.S. stocks are more overvalued or were more overvalued than they've ever been. I mean, they, they were pretty ridiculously overvalued. And that whole bubble is just starting to collapse, right? So you're seeing that in multiple sectors, not just in, uh, not just in technology. And that, that's, that's what's really uh, driving these uh, sort of very disproportionate numbers. Um, now let's turn that into a real uh, um, hedge fund because um, that's what we were going to talk about, right? So, so far we were just setting the stage. We were just laying down the foundations to <laughs> get to this place. Um, now the, the, the point is that, <clears throat> um, the point is that uh, once you've got all the high octane smart betas in place, right? And I was just showing you the signal spreads. That's just top minus bottom. You're long the top stocks equal weighted, and you're short the bottom stocks equal weighted, and it's nothing fancy going on, except for the ensemble learning, and you just keep rebalancing. Now we're going to do something much fancier. Now we're going to make it look like a real hedge fund. This is basically going to be fancier than mostly what folks like AQR run. So in fact, this thing has been doing very well against AQR. We've been publishing it live for three and a quarter years. It's about 120% ahead of AQR now. Gross. Um, and again, I'll show you the reason why, but let me at least describe the construction, okay? So the, the construct here is that it's got to be dollar neutral. It's, it's meant to be a market neutral fund, right? So it's dollar neutral. It's uh, almost completely beta neutral, plus minus 0.01. That's how much uh, room you give the optimizer. And, you know, you give it a little bit of wiggle room on the sector industry, like 2.5%. Um, you, you, you let the stocks, I and mean, obviously you got to constrain the stocks. For this is not... Uh, uh, seat of the pants. Um, there are a couple of other noteworthy things going on. One is that, you know, uh, beneath the covers, uh, uh, we've got all these things like uh, some constraints on uh, earnings torpedoes. We've got constraints on mean reversion. So what you want to do is to have clever constraints that prevent situations like GameStop. You don't want to get short squeezed on GameStop. You don't want to get hit on, you know, uh, th those type of episodes. So that's what those things are for. And then what we also do, because uh, the hedge fund industry is very obsessed with, uh, with idiosyncratic alpha these days, we actually take the five most common factors which correspond to a risk model, a simple risk model like axioma, and then we just neutralize them. Okay, so as part of the optimization, you're neutralizing any exposure to a simple PE, uh, PB type of uh, risk factor as embodied by some commercial vendor model like axioma. And uh, that, that means that whatever's left is now, at least with respect to that risk model, pure alpha. Okay? So this is supposed to be pure idiosyncratic alpha. You can see gross, 100 by 100. This thing's been tracking 27.7 annualized. AQR is down percent and a half. Um, this AQR fund, by the way, which is also market neutral, had a 60% drawdown top to bottom, if I recall correctly. But you can look up the ticker. It's in Bloomberg. It's called QMNIX. It's very easy to look up. Completely public information. There's nothing top secret here. <laughs> um, so if you take the chart from Yahoo Finance or Bloomberg or whatever, just plot it against my chart, you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, the roughly 28% uh, gross spread annualized, you know, that turns into a QM 120-ish or so over the, th over the last three and a uh, quarter years. Um, you know, and, and you can sort of uh, uh, try to rationalize the... Uh, now, let me, let me show you something else. So now what happens if you go back 22 years, right? So um, this comparison looks a bit silly. Obviously, you may want to do a log chart or something. It, it looks a bit you know, too extreme because the index itself doesn't do anything, right? Like the problem is that the market neutral indices like HFR, which just average out a whole bunch of hedge funds, right? They end up having very much close to zero returns because you have some good managers and bad managers and <laughs> It just sort of washes out. So the actual hedge fund indices over 22 years have not done anything. You can see that. That's HFR. Um, and that makes our chart look a little bit ridiculous. But you know, at least there's a, a nice looking drawdown, so it doesn't look too, too contrived. Um, all right. Uh, but that's just to give you a flavor. Now, this is meant to be our high vol strategy, right? That's just taking the same source of alpha, which is one of the flagship signals, and bear in mind, you could have run it in any of them, and we're not just taking the top guy from now, which is GARP, and saying, oh, let's just you know, go back and make it look better. We, we just take Sizzling 7, because that's sort of our flagship that we, we, we advertise. And, um, we run it on Sizzling 7, but the decision has to be ex ante. It would be cheating to do it ex post. 
And this one's also, in, all of them are on Sizzling 7. So you're optimizing to Sizzling 7. But here, uh, we, we make it much lower vol, right? So this one's only, instead of 15, this is like 7 and change. And to get the vol down that far, you have to do a little extra work. So in this case, uh, you'll notice that we've neutralized 18 naive factors. So for every smart beta, there's a corresponding naive factor, right? Remember, we had uh, debt to equity for leverage and price to equity, uh, you know, earnings for whatever, for uh, relative value and so on. So in every case, you take the corresponding naive factor, neutralize it, reduces, um, you know, just tighten all the constraints, uh, um, and the vol comes down pretty dramatically. In fact, I mean, the 22-year vol is much lower than this. The reason this vol is a little higher than the longer term is because obviously you had COVID, right? So you had the big COVID crash. You can see that 11.8% rodan episode in there. You can see that um, we also had some turbulence in Q4. So that, that's why the vol is higher than the 6.2 in here. Uh, but this is the 22-year chart. So you get the idea. Once, once you have the... Uh, once you have the overall platform and the framework, then it's possible to do very powerful things with it. So you can do all kinds of cool stuff. Like once, once you've got the smart betas and the ensemble learners sort of driving the high octane uh, performance, you can turn that into sector rotation, into crash baskets, into risk models, into you know sharp 92 type of style analysis, into uh, you know into well, it's really meant to be alphas for uh, a hedge fund in the boxes, as I was uh, talking about, but. Um, um, let me open it up, up to questions.